gold has definitely perked up. And I think that's a worthy discussion to have is, you know, how well is the stock market doing in real money? Because I think so much of the appreciation we've seen in recent years has been a function of, you know, currency debasement. So in, if you, if you, uh, if you adjust S and P returns for the price of gold, they don't look too good. We're big believers when a, uh, an asset class or security makes a multi-year new high, in this case, an all-time new high, that's a very bullish signal. You typically will keep on going. Now, oftentimes, interestingly, it goes up about 20% and it kind of consolidates. And that's exactly what we've seen so far. But long-term, I do think gold goes a lot higher. Could it be 5,000? Could it be 10,000? I don't know. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. We have a doozy lined up for you today because I'm looking forward to reconnecting here with David Hay. He is the haymaker. He's also the co-CIO of Evergreen Gavacal, and uh, he rides a fantastic Substack with over 16,000 followers now. Go check that out. We'll put the link down below. Really looking forward to catching up with him because the last time we spoke was in August. So a lot has happened, but I was just telling him, I was like, yes, a lot has happened, but has a lot really happened? It feels like we're just treading water. We're just trucking along. Not much has changed on, on the surface because... No big impacts, no big turmoil, no big market turbulence. The S&P is running from all-time high to all-time high. Gold is doing okay. So who are we to complain, right? But uh, let, let's take a look at the cracks. Like uh, We're not a doom and gloom channel, but we're trying to educate and we're trying to figure out what is happening. Hence, discussing the macro to understand the micro. Before I switch over to my guest, click on the like and subscribe button. Turn on the alarm icon as well. That way you get notified when we upload a new video. So without much further ado, David, it is welcome, or it is great to welcome you back here on the channel. It's good to see you again. Hi, Kai. That's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> hi, Kai. Yeah, that works. That works. Because uh, well, hi name, also you know, means... People say, say hey or hey, hey, you know, so I get oh. that kind of thing all the time. Hey, hey. Oh, there. Oh, good. Good one. I'll remember that for next one, <laughs> for the next one there. Uh, uh, too, too late now. Too late now, David. But uh, it's great to have you back. And uh, we, we have lots to catch up on, of course. There's over 10 months of economic data we need to catch up on and uh, market trends. And uh, we, we need to figure out where things are headed, of course, as well. Um, but to get us started, like I'm going to ask you my, my sort of generic opening line, like, and my opening question is like, how, how is the economy doing? And I've asked you that in August, so I'm going to contrast that a bit or compare it a bit to August. But uh, how is the economy doing and uh, what has changed? Well, I'd say it's doing worse than it was in August, though it wasn't, you know, for a tremendous at that point, but it was stronger than today. In fact, we just had, uh, what, eight different releases last week, economic releases, and every single one of them missed. And we're seeing GDP revise downward. Last year, the revisions were or at least the releases were positive at the time contemporaneously, and then revisions tended to be generally softer. When you look at you know, the jobs market, which of course is critical, those revisions have been almost uniformly lower, and that's been going on for well over a year. So I think that's a really key thing, Kai, is what's happening to revisions? Because so often the data that comes out initially is way off, and yet that's what gets the attention. And so to really get, I think, a sense of where the economy is going, look at those revisions and they haven't been good. So I, I think it's fair to say the economy is in a soft phase, soft patch, whether that's going to, going to, uh, to disappoint the, the legions of people out there that believe that we're going to have a soft landing. I mean, that is certainly the consensus view or no landing. But uh, the data has started to look a little harder here lately, hard landing-ish. So uh, yeah, I'd color me somewhat confused on the economy. I mean, one of the things that, that really helped last year maybe was the number one reason we had a decent economy last year was the federal deficit doubled. It went from $1 trillion to $2 trillion with you know, normal accounting. There were some kind of games they played to make it look less bad. But uh, then it looked like it was going to be significantly better this year. But since February, uh, the Congressional Budget Office has raised the deficit projection by $400 billion. So it looks like we're right back in another $2 trillion deficit. And as the very astute uh, Luke Groman has said here recently, you, you can't have a recession when the government's running $2 trillion deficits, which are something like 7% of GDP. And he's got a point. <clears throat> now, I'm going to be talking with my great friend, Daniel DiMartino Booth, later this week. And she's going to make the point it's not the size, it's the rate of change. And if the rate of change is basically flat versus last year, it was 100%, it doubled. 
you know, that's not nearly as, as stimulative. Uh, you know, I hear both of those arguments. I think it's going to be quite an interesting tug of war, but I think it's very important for your your viewers to watch what's happening with the federal deficit. Yeah, a lot, lot hinges on that and, uh, you know, refinancing that deficit or the, you know, the, the the bonds, the treasuries, the T bills uh, that, that that have to be issued to sort of cover that deficit, I think, is an interesting indicator to watch. Um, I spoke with Alistair McLeod earlier today, and uh, while while he was talking, I was googling uh, U.S. debt issuance and uh, demand for it. There's no news on it. There's zero news on uh, who, who's picking up the debt, who's picking up the bonds, and what the demand for that is. Can you can you shine some light for us on that? Because I couldn't find anything. Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, well, I, what I do see is that you see reports of the hedge, well, certain countries being big buyers of treasuries like Luxembourg. Uh, and I think another one is Cayman Islands. But these, these countries that are rather, you know, very small, but are yet huge buyers of, head, of treasuries, how can that be? Well, I think it's because they're basically conduits for hedge funds. So I think that's, you know, that's what's making it a bit trickier too, even if you do identify that data could be misleading. But what's clear is the major foreign central banks are divesting uh, or not, not increasing their U.S. treasuries. So with this tremendous surge of issuance, uh, who's taking, picking up the slack? And I think, frankly, what's happening is it's a lot of U.S. retail and the banking system, which have been the main buyers, uh, because the Fed, as you kind of alluded to, is no longer, they're not doing QE anymore. They've been doing QT, which is where they shrink their balance sheets. So they've actually been letting their bonds mature. So you've lost the two biggest buyers of treasuries between foreign central banks and the Fed. So I think that's why you're seeing this dynamic in the treasury market where so much of the issuance is at the short end, because the, the, the long end is very fragile. And you would think that with short rates higher than long rates, they would want to sell some debt further out to lower the interest costs. But uh, they just when they try to do that, it, it seems to swap the market. So it's uh, it, it's a problem, and there's just there's just no two ways about it. It's uh, you know the, the Treasury and the Fed have got themselves into a very difficult situation. And personally, I think the only way they get out of it long term is with kind of stealth inflation, and where they tell you inflation is two or three percent and yet you know there's actually a, if you've heard of this chapwood index they just did an analysis of the actual cost of living in the 50 largest u.s cities last year and it ranges from like eight to 13 percent way way above the official inflation number and it was the same thing in 2022 and just as a personal on a personal basis that's what my wife is constantly telling me she the power shop or she goes to the grocery store and she's saying these these prices aren't up 25% from 2019. They're up 50, 75, 100% or more from where they were in 2019. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And if you look at like the CPI, the CPI doesn't include the cost of homeowner insurance and homeowner insurance is up, was up last year about 30%. So it's, there's a lot of funny stuff going on with the inflation numbers. And some of it I think is just, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of noise. There's some things that are up, some things are down. There's definitely been cooling. When you talk about commodities, uh, there's been a lot of commodity price weakness over the last couple of years until recently. And you mentioned gold. I mean, gold is definitely perked up. And I think that's a worthy discussion to have is, you know, how well is the stock market doing in real money? Because I think so much of the appreciation we've seen in recent years has been a function of, you know, currency debasement. So in, if you, if you, uh, if you adjust S and P returns for the price of gold, they don't look too good. Hmm. Yeah, I've, ne I've never ran that metric to be honest. Like uh, S and P versus gold, and uh, what what that would look like because uh, we're trading at all time high right now in the S and P fifty four fifty, I believe. So, uh, but, but so really is gold. Has 2340 it's down a little bit uh, less or more more than the S and P five hundred. So there has been a bit of a decoupling. Um, you, you brought up a few topics because I quickly wanted to jump down the bond rabbit hole with you, but then you brought up inflation and other economic indicators. But uh, just to stay on that bond topic real quick, how, how attractive is a 4.25% uh, yield right now in the 10-year? And uh, uh, it seems like it's coming down the yield meaning. So the, the bond interest is picking up. People are seem to be f fleeing is maybe a strong word, but uh, to be rushing into bonds right now, especially longer 10-year bonds. Uh, how, how attractive is that yield right now? Well, I think those bonds might make sense on a trading basis. You know, I think Jeff Gunlock said it well here recently where you could get a, what he called a Pavlovian bond market rally, 
where if the economic data is weak enough that people just do the usual flight into treasuries. So maybe you go from four and a quarter to three and a half. I don't know, you know, maybe even lower than that. But if we really do have a recession, you got to kind of you know, go to the next step or connect the dots and say, if that happens, what's the policy response going to be? In his view and my view, it's going to be very inflationary. I, I don't believe the U.S. can withstand a severe recession. You know, maybe a mild one. And the way they keep it mild is by doing all kinds of uh, liquidity infusions to prop things up. And I think that kind of pertains to the stock market too. That it's, that's one reason why the stock market has in nominal terms been so buoyant is there's just been these liquidity blasts that have kind of come out of all, all kinds of different places at different angles. You know, whether it's the bank term funding program where we had those bank failures in the spring of last year or the reverse repo program that got so big and then has been drawn down or the, the treasury's uh, checking account, the TGGA, TGA, which is quite large right now. I personally think they're going to recycle that, to dump a lot of that into the economy between now and November, uh, because that's controlled by Janet Yellen. She clearly doesn't want to see Donald Trump back in the White House. And, and I don't think Jay Powell does either, frankly. But so lots of lots of puts and takes. But in general, I think, that, you know, summarize, I think the economy is weakening. And I think if it weakens a little, that's probably not going to create too much of a response. But if it, if it really starts to turn down and, and certainly some bright people like Daniel D. Martino Booth, Lacey Hunt, they believe it is David Rosenberg. It is going to turn down hard. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I really think that the, you've got this tremendous tug of war with still $2 trillion of fiscal stimulus in the system. It is hard to have recessions when you've got that kind of fake money coursing through the, the veins of the economy. One aspect of the economy, of course, is the consumer, because that's the one aspect or the one group that has propped up the economy for the longest time due to also the, all the COVID stimulus as well. But to, to steal somebody else's, uh, what do you call it, like uh, euphemism here, is the, the, the pig is pretty much through the python, right? It, like it has been like sort of gobbled up, it's been chewed through, it's digested. And it's done with like the consumer is starting to dip into savings again. I just looked up earlier uh, before our conversation, the consumer savings is dropping. Right. So so how strong is the consumer? Can we still rely on the consumer to keep the economy going right now? I've said this before to other with other bright people like your folk, well, like yourself, that uh, it's very much a tale of two consumers, just like I think it's a tale of two corporate sectors, too, because the, the tremendous increase in interest rates for the wealthier investor is, is manna from heaven. That money that they were earning virtually nothing on, they're now earning, you know, five percent. And so there's a, this. So if you think about the, the federal interest rate, uh, interest cost, how much it's gone up from say five hundred billion to a trillion. That extra five hundred billion is just rocket fuel for the the high end consumer. I think that's why you're seeing, you know, articles about how uh, American tourists in, in Europe are really propping up a lot of those economies over there. So the affluent are feeling very fluent. And they're traveling and they're spending and so it's uh but if you look at the lower end where people have got you know like i think you mentioned before we started recording that about a quarter of consumers are planning to travel this year and do it with debt which means on plastic and you know those rates are like 23 percent i mean truly usurious so it's uh and small businesses which you know those are guys are the, the main job creators and destroyers and their interest rates are going up sharply, have gone up sharply. So in many cases, they're paying 9, 10, 11%. And they really can't afford that. So I, I think what you're starting to see is, uh, well, first of all, there is a spike of bank failures for sure. There's also been a major breakout to the upside of credit card defaults, auto loan defaults. So you're seeing plenty of signs of stress. You're even starting to see that in the shadow banking system with some of these private credit deals going down and having to be restructured. So I think there's plenty of early warning indicators that are, uh, you know, that are starting to flash at least yellow, but uh, it is very mixed. I, I just read an interesting statistic the other day as well. A trip to Disney in general puts a family $2,000 into debt. <laughs> Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Really? So people are willing to invest into experiences, which I get, but not really looking ahead. Like you said, 23% credit card debt. That's not sustainable. You just open a new credit card account and default like that, that can't work. Yeah, it's one thing if you're borrowing money to buy an asset and uh, theoretically or hopefully that asset generates a cash flow at least equal to your interest payment. But when you just spend it, you know, you're, you're, you, then you've got the, the debt left and the interest rate on the debt. And it's, you know, really get into a hole that for a lot of people, the only way out of that hole is bankruptcy. 
I did mean, since we're kind of on the topic of inflation, I didn't want to correct what I said. I said home premiums went up 30% last year. That's not true. They've gone up 40%. This is insurance premiums on homes. 40% since COVID. So it's it's a lot. It's a lot more than the CPI, but it's I don't want to exaggerate. So just to be clear on that. No, I appreciate that. But uh, on, on the topic for inflation, I'm I'm seeing a very bifurcated picture. And we briefly talked about it um, off off camera before hitting the record button. Like where I mentioned, like I was in South Carolina, and I saw gas at the pump for two seventy nine a gallon, and then you mentioned that you got gas recently for seven dollars a gallon in California. So there's a massive west to east uh, de- decline and uh, gap here. Um, but how does that factor into inflation? It seems like on the, on the east coast, especially like some of the, uh, the maybe the Republican states, it seems like that the gas Gas prices are lower. I think Utah is around three bucks, three thirty. Um, closer to California, obviously. So I'm curious, like, how does that factor in? Because uh, you can't really compare apples and oranges when you look at California versus the rest of the U.S., for example. Is is inflation way higher in California? <laughs> well, that's part of it, but it's it's just kind of the whole California experience, which <laughs> is you know there, there's lots of regulation, there's lots of taxes anyway, but then you have the environmental taxes where they're actively trying to discourage the consumption of uh, gasoline and trying to force people to go to EVs, which is a whole nother story considering what's happening to electricity prices, but let's put that aside. But that's, I mean, so some of this is an intentional policy driven uh, situation. I mean, where I'm sitting here, I'm only five miles from the Idaho border in the state of Washington, which also has very high gas taxes, more so on the west side of the mountains than where I am, but still we can drive you know, five miles and say 50 cents or more a gallon. And so it's, so, you know, it's the Idaho versus Washington, just like South Carolina versus South Southern California. It's uh, yeah, taxes. People don't realize them when you, know, if you ever actually look at the breakdown of how much of what you're paying at the pump is a function of taxes. It's huge. And it's really huge in these uh, left coast states. Hmm. I uh, also picked up a headline the other day, Joe Biden plans to release more from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to keep oil prices in check. Um, you're rolling your eyes there. <laughs> so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, uh, David. Well, well, it's an interesting definition. I mean, this is an emergency stockpile, right? And yeah. I guess his election is considered to be an emergency. <laughs> his re-election attempt. I mean, it, it, you could, when they first did the massive release, you could say, well, that's because of the invasion of Ukraine. And the IEA, and we could talk about the IEA, the International Energy Agency that's been so wrong, and we talked before we started recording, that its track record is so horrible that it makes the feds look good when it comes to forecasting the future. And it's, uh, you know, it's it was assuming the loss of 3 million barrels of Russian oil, and so that kind of gave the Biden administration cover to do the big SBR releases. Now, interestingly, they usually underestimate demand by quite a bit. That's why they've been so wrong for so many years, usually because of uh, much stronger than they anticipate demand out of the developing world, the emerging world. Uh, but in for Q3 and Q4, they're actually estimating very, very high demand, uh, completely out of bounds with what they typically do and inconsistent with this decelerating economy. So one could wonder if they're once again creating some cover here for another SBR release, even though you know in the fullness of time, their numbers are likely to be proven dead wrong again. So it's just, you know, I, I get cynical. I mean, if both parties do this kind of stuff, there's just so much manipulation and, and so many distortions to try to bring about an election outcome. And, you know, it's just like the security of the country is way down the list of priorities. Now, it's an interesting topic, and uh, I'm not sure how deep we want to dive in there, but uh, why not replenish at $75 when you release at 90 and higher, right? Uh, it seems like a logical trade, in my opinion, just being pragmatic here. And they did a little bit of that, but very little. And then now they're you know, dropping hints that they're going to release more. And you know, oil has rallied a little bit, so that also gives them some cover. And uh, th- that market is really lends itself to distortion because the paper market, the futures market, derivative market, whatever we want to say, it is like thirty to fifty times the cash market. Most commodities, it's more like three times, four times, five times. So it's uh, when you get a bunch of the the hedge funds, let's say especially if they sense that they are getting official encouragement to take a stance or like they believe like, okay, well, the price is kind of capped because they'll release more oil if the price goes up. Therefore, my if I'm shorting, my risk is relatively limited and we could get another these sharp breaks down, down to the you know, low 70s. And so it, it really encourages the hedge fund community to take a ne- negative stance. 
And I think that's part of why oil has been as weak as it has, despite the fact that if you just for the SPR, most of the reports, frankly, I don't do that. They look at the official numbers, which include all these uh, SPR releases, and they say hey, inventories look fine or maybe even a little high. But if you take those out, as you should, and look at total inventories, inventories are really, really low. So lots of misinformation out there. It's almost, I mean, I think the IEA has become incredibly, incredibly politicized. Congress is now coming after them. Several congressional individuals have sent letters to the IA. So what are you, you know, why are you putting out all this bad information and what's your motivation? And anyway, it's, uh, it's a, that could be a whole podcast right there. <laughs> we'll save that for next time because that's way out of my area of expertise. I need to do some reading first. So, um, but uh, it's an interesting tidbit because uh, it all factors also into the inflation debate. I'm looking at uh, crude oil about eighty two to eighty one dollars right now. Uh, Brent is it's not really relevant in the U S. But uh, uh, Brent is more the North Sea uh, oil, um, so it's at eighty five. But uh, it is trending higher. So I'm curious, like the inflation pressures we talked about, they're still existing. We're over three percent still in the U S. Um, Trying to think, I'm trying to make the segue to the Fed because we need to talk about unemployment first before we talk about the Fed because inflation and unemployment are the two sort of pillars the Fed bases their main decisions on, right? Um, unemployment theoretically. Has up over theoretically. <laughs> I'll put the S&P um, 500 in there too. Yeah. And, maybe now, and uh, uh, the, the elections. And, uh, <laughs> no, exactly. But uh, let's talk unemployment because we're finally seeing, or sounds like I'm relieved to see it, but a uh, 4% four, four handle or a 4 handle on the unemployment numbers. Got a jobs report the other day that surprised to the upside. Um, what what do you make of the unemployment data and the jobs reports these days? Like, uh, what, what is it telling you? Like, what what kind of picture is it painting? It's another tale of two. If you look at the official non-farm payrolls, they have been much much stronger than the household survey. And part of it is the response rates to the household. I'm sorry, to the non-farm official non-farm payroll reports are very low. They've collapsed since COVID. They've come from something like over 60% to around 40%. It's a relatively small sample set is another thing. And if you look historically, the household survey, which is a much broader uh, sample set, if you will, is it tends to be more accurate around inflection points. Typically, they trend fairly close together. But when you see the kind of divergence that we've seen lately, where the household survey is reporting actually significant full-time job losses, like uh, around a million, and where you're getting increased uh, employment is with part-time jobs. So it's a very different story. And, and I think the reason, another reason to believe that the household survey is more accurate is when the uh, official non-farm payroll survey is revised and has been for you know, well over a year, almost every single one of those revisions has been lower. I think there was one month where it was higher. So it's, I guess I would just tell you, I don't think the jobs market is nearly as strong as what is officially reported. But even if you look at the official number going from say 4.4, sorry, 3.4 at the low to four up 60 basis points, that's typically associated with a recession, that kind of a jump. Uh, now, if it goes to 4.4, which the Fed seems to be endorsing, that would be like a, a, a lead pipe cinch to have a recession. However, I think what's, what's different this time is the immigration, the illegal immigration, where you're bringing in a lot of workers. Now they're you know, probably more likely to be picked up by the household survey than the non-farm payroll. But you could say, and I think it's fair, that there's a lot more employment out there uh, that's kind of off off the radar, so to speak. So it, that does not help in terms of making this data less confusing. It's it's just another complication, but it's a real one. I mean, we're talking billions of people. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of people have two or three jobs as well. So it's really difficult to look through that data um, and really Pretty understand it. Like, uh, like, I don't personally don't want to be in Jerome Powell's shoes. Uh, it's not a job I'd like to make because whatever he does is probably the wrong thing. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way he goes. Uh, some Everybody's going to hate him. doesn't matter. Um, but uh, talking about the Fed now, and I, I gave you a couple pointers before we hit the record button, what I was going to ask you. But uh, in in hindsight, like up, up until today, what, what kind of school grade would you give Jerome Powell? You know, it's tough. It depends on the semester of the quarter because there's some semesters where I would have given him an A and others I'd given him an F. I mean, certainly the, the behavior during COVID and he swore he was not going to do MMT. That it was a terrible idea, but that's basically what they did. Modern monetary theory where they the government spent trillions of dollars and the Fed monetized that, uh, they, you know, did the, the QT, the massive uh, QE rather, massive QE during COVID. And then to say that inflation was transferring, kept repeating that, and then kept buying mortgage-backed securities, 
even as the housing market was absolutely exploding and a lot of bad moves in, in that period of time. But then in 2022, he started to want to become like Paul Volcker. He got really, really aggressive. This has been a, a very significant tightening campaign and you know quite appropriate. And you got to say, well, man, he's been able to do that plus QT. So where they did shrink the balance sheet by a couple trillion, I believe was roughly the number. And yet we've stayed out of recession that you got to say that's pretty darn good. You know, give him a B plus, maybe an A minus for that. But then his these flip flops, these like he did in December, where he said, we're not even thinking about uh, lowering interest rates. And then two weeks later, they said, we're now talking about when we're going to cut rates. It's like, well, what happened? You know, the Senate could say, well, that's because the, the Biden poll numbers absolutely collapsed back then. But whatever his motivation is, a very, very strange pivot without really any economic data. And that's why the market, as you may remember, guy was anticipating six to seven rate cuts in January, late December, January, because of how dovish he became almost overnight. And then, you know, we've had some three bad inflation numbers in a row, and then he kind of flipped back to more hawk issues. There's an awful lot of volatility in the Fed's stance and, and their commentary. And you got so many of them out there, you know, blathering away. It's, it's like, there, there's just too much, it's TMI, too much information. <laughs> And so much of it is conflicting. So it makes it very, very difficult if you're you know, listening to what they say to figure out what they mean. Yeah, and all the presidents of the Fed presidents all are giving speaking spots at all the universities and economic forums, and uh, everybody gets to, to, to shoot their mouth off, right? And exactly. everybody has a different opinion and just completely confusing the market. And uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, if, if you were Jerome Powell, David, what would you do next? Like, uh, you have 36 days to make up your mind. What, what would you do next? Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, if I couldn't resign, then <laughs> I guess that, I'd that, have that's, to... that's out of the option. Yeah, that's not an option. Okay. That's not an option. I guess I'd have to... Uh, I would just try to really reform the Fed. Is You know, he's... It doesn't have to be as collegial as he makes it out right now. And I think it's time for him to take the bull by the horns and say, look, guys, shut up. You know, we're not we're not going to put out all this information. We don't really know. I mean, I think you've, you've seen a bit of that in his tones where he'll you know talk about it like he's trying to fly a plane during it, you know, in a, a dense fog. And he's, you know, without their instruments working properly. And so he's making some concessions to reality here recently. And I think he needs to do more of that. And it probably would be smart. I mean, I would to lean heavily on what the two year Treasury note is doing and how it's behaving. Uh, to get a better sense of what perhaps their policy should be, you know, rather than trying to do it with all these, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of PhDs they have on staff, but they're, again, their their track record of anticipating things, even anticipating it, short-term interest rates, which they control. They only get that right about a third of the time. It's it's pretty embarrassing. So I think saying, you know, admitting your fallibility and defaulting to something that's had a much better predictive record, meaning the two-year treasury note, would be a really good first step. And other than that, I, I mean, I think at some point he's got to say, I know we're not politicians, but Congress, you've got to quit spending. You've got to get your spending under control. It's not a revenue problem. It's a spending problem. And this is before we've really been hit by the full tsunami of the entitlement payouts. I, I just heard a very credible source say that the present value of the unfunded entitlements is $100 trillion. And I don't know if that's the right number. I've heard Gunlock say more like 50 or 60, but it's a huge number and it's off balance sheet. And so the Fed's in a really tough situation and Congress is making it worse and worse. And I think he's got to play hardball with them and say, look, you guys can't get your spending under control. I, there's not much I can do about interest rates. Interest rates are likely to go a lot higher with these deficits. So I try to be you know, just more realistic and, and more straight talking. David, just, just to follow up on this, and I should have asked that question to guests like months ago, but why are those sort of liabilities off balance sheet? Like, why is that not being accounted for? Like, how, how does that make any sense? If I own my employees, their, their retirement money, that has to show up on the balance sheet. I can't just run this off balance sheet as a company. How, how, how does that work? Can you explain that to us? It's more of a, maybe a, a, almost a dumb question, it feels like, but I, I feel like we need that bit of explainer here for now. No, it, it's not a dumb question. It's a very good question, but I think it's a very simple answer is because if they did, it would look horrible and it would create even more panic and drive interest rates higher yet. So, you know, the, the, what, what have politicians been doing for the last 20, 25 years in, in America and the West is they just, you know, it, everybody says it, it's just true, kick the can. You know, get until you're out of office or your term is up as a Fed chairman or whatever, just keep things going 
And, you know, hopefully the stock market will be really strong and that'll make people feel good. And they'll be, you know, buying cars at a faster rate than they would normally, although they're not buying cars that fast right now, actually. But it's it's just so staggering to think about. And since you brought it up, I think it's one of the, I mean, there's been so many policy errors in the last 20, 25 years. But I think one going back 40 years was the failure to put real assets into Social Security, which they easily could have. The federal government could have easily done that. They instead... They put in these special treasuries, which, you know, say, well, that's the safest security on the planet. But if it's just more debt that the government owes that it can't pay, and, you know, it's one thing if you're running surpluses around, you know, roughly balanced budgets, but when you're running these massive deficits, then your, your regular on balance sheet IOUs are questionable enough. And then when you have all this stuff, it's just like that, that isn't safe. That's not safe money. And there's really nothing there. There are very few things I agree with Paul Krugman on, but he said, Social Security, the way it's constructed is basically a Ponzi scheme. There's no there there. There's no assets in the Social Security Trust Fund other than these government IOUs, which are already unserviceable. So if just imagine if 40 years ago, all those years of surpluses, because Social Security was when the baby boomers were at peak earnings, running these massive surpluses, if that had been put into a, like a blended portfolio of stocks and bonds, could have been just indexed, didn't have, you didn't have to pick anything. It would be probably the largest sovereign wealth fund on the planet. And it wouldn't be unfunded. It would be funded. But they missed that opportunity. It's just inexcusable. I've really seen nobody write on that except Phil Graham. He wrote a Wall Street Journal editorial I heard a few months ago saying exactly the same thing. Regardless, it was a huge policy blunder and we're going to pay dearly for it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see how that plays out because eventually Duda will hit. It's not going to be good. It's not nope. that one that can nope. you. It's not going to be good. <laughs> no, um, David, sort of, sort of summarize, maybe a summary question here as well, sort of based on what we just discussed. Like, what, what camp are you in? No landing, soft landing, hard landing? How, how do you think? Uh, how do you think things are going to play out? Well, I kind of admitted it. You know, this is basically what I was saying about the Fed. I think you have to be honest about your fallibility, and I find this a very difficult one to analyze accurately. And so. You know, I concede the $2 trillion is, is a very stimulative situation, $2 trillion of deficit spending. So I, what, I, what I think, since I, I, I'm conflicted, as I, I'm obviously making this sound, is that the, on a risk-reward basis, I think the challenge for the no-landing, soft-landing camp is that it's so widely anticipated. And there is enough stuff going wrong that I think you could make the case that we will get a semi-hard landing. And therefore, the market reaction would be very severe. So, so much of this is, you know, you try to position where if you're right, you make really good money. And if you're wrong, you don't get hurt too badly. And that typically means you have to be out of consensus. Now, often the consensus is right. The consensus has been right so far about the soft landing. But you know, I think at some point, something goes wrong that creates, you know, more of a panic situation. And that, that you know, feeds into this already weakening economic backdrop. But it's it's very confusing, and it's I mean one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Robert uh, Robert Murrow, the famous journalist, who years ago, decades ago, said, "If anyone uh, doesn't isn't confused, if anyone isn't confused, they clearly don't understand the situation." And I think those words are extremely appropriate in the environment we're in right now. Fantastic! I'm extremely confused, so probably that helps. <laughs> so I I know that I know nothing. Right? Wasn't that Socrates or something? Or somebody who said that? Um, he was a wise man, whoever did. <laughs> exactly. Um, quickly on the deficit, it was really interesting. Um, I, I just looked it up. The Congressional Budget Office uh, rate raised the budget deficit expectations by 27% for this year alone, um, just based on a package that was signed in April, military spending for Ukraine and Israel, higher estimated cost of reducing student loan borrower balances. I think that is an interesting one because I know we touched on that one last time we spoke in August. That sounds like it is an election present. Uh, another one is Medicaid spending, which which I'm personally fine with because that goes to the right people. Um, higher spending on FDIC insurance after the bank bailouts in, uh, in uh, 2023 and earlier 2024. Um, I want to talk student loan real quick uh, as well because we touched on that. Like, how, how has that played out since we last spoke in August? Um, have students, did they have to repay? Like, I lost track of it a little bit. I'm curious, but I know Biden brought it up recently again. What, what, what's the situation with student loans these days? Well, apparently he's going to go against what the Supreme Court ruled and cancel the student loan debt. And so it's, uh, you know, there's complications to it, as I understand it, that it's... Uh, 
you know, it's not a complete wipeout of student loan debt. And that's, there's some, cons there's some uh, discussion whether uh, if you do default, that does that hit your track, your uh, credit score or not? And I believe the way he's, he's crafted the legislation is it won't hurt your credit score. It's just debt forgiveness. Uh, but it's apparently rather uh, variable as to who it benefits and who it doesn't. Uh, so I, I know that there's, there's some people that are you know pretty upset about it, but it's, I don't know, it, it's, I hear, you know, the whole thing with higher education has been such a scam. I mean, the, the fact that it costs so much to go to school these days versus when I was young, where it was, you know, a few hundred dollars a quarter. And I don't think the education has gotten that much better. And so these poor people come out of college with massive debts. That's, you know, that's unfortunate. That's, so, you know, I could kind of get some relief there, but I also think it's, you know, we got to take some personal responsibility. Americans aren't that great about taking personal responsibility. And, you know, did you get your degree in, you know, nuclear engineering or did you get it in arts and crafts or, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever, you know, something like that's more of a social, where you're just going to have a hard time making enough money to ever pay your student loan debt. And you know, so I do think there is, if you're going to take a lot of student loan debt, you, you should have an occupation that's going to generate enough cash flow to be able to service it. That's not that hard to figure out. But anyway, it's it's going to, I think another thing that you mentioned in passing, which is interesting about this $400 billion increase in the deficit is 60 billion of it is related to the bank, the FDIC, because there was a bank failure here recently that did cost the FDC about that amount of money. So I think it probably is related to that. And it, it was, it got very little press. And so there's, I've been su suspecting that the, the banking crisis is not over, but that's really kind of the first development along those lines. So, so far it's been pretty contained, but I got to believe with what's gone on in commercial real estate, where it's an absolute disaster, you know, where a lot of these buildings are down 70, 80% in price and the lenders are getting the properties back and they're going to take big hits and then they're underwater on their bond portfolios and uh, even multifamily loans in some cases are troubled and it's it's hard to believe that the banking crisis is over, but maybe I'm wrong. But this latest event did, would seem to be indicated. And this is a fairly small bank that cost the FTC a lot of money. Which one was that? Um, can you I can't even remember. It was, it, was a, okay. it, was, it was a small bank. And I don't want to misquote that it was $60 billion, but it is coincidental. That's the, the number I remember. And that's about the amount that they just increased the FDIC funding by. So it's kind of logical because the other one, you know, that was over a year ago, the three, which was Signature Bank and uh, First Republic and, uh, oh gosh, what was, there was a third one, Silicon Valley Bank, of course, SVB. So yeah, those Republic the First Bank. No was First Republic, Republic First Republic. First Republic. Oh, well, yeah, the, the most recent one. That's why it was kind of confusing. It was very similar to First Republic. It's Republic First. <laughs> yeah, it was just the inverse, but different one. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Really interesting. Um, I had a discussion with a friend the other day about uh, calling the U.S. debt. And uh, we were talking about briefly, and we both didn't really have facts, so I actually looked it up after the discussion. But uh, let, let's assume the U.S. is about $34, $35 in debt in general. Um, who, who owns the debt? Like, and can it be called on? I'm, I'm curious, because we talked about like uh, Japan and China <laughs> uh, you, you know, owing, uh, own, owning a lot of that debt. Um, but that's maybe even two trillion out of the thirty-five that's owned by these two nations, and that's out of a, I think, it's seven trillion that's owned by foreign governments um, of the U.S. debt. So there's twenty-eight billion still left, uh, you know, what do you call it, unallocated or domestic debt to a degree. Um, curious, can it be called on? Well, first of all, you're forgetting a very big holder of U.S. debt, the Fed. So the Fed owns about seven trillion of U.S. debt that is bought with all, you know, with fake money and. I was listening to David Zeros uh, yesterday, I believe it was, and he said, hey, look, don't worry about it. That, that's money that you know, we'll never have to repay. It, and it's just the government you know, going from left hand to right hand. And so you know, that's how we can solve the situation. And, you know, he's, if you look at the Bank of Japan, which owns way more of a percentage of their debt than does the Fed, it's you know, GDP, it's, it's possible. You could go even higher. And I guess the theory is you don't have to repay it. But Anytime that sounds like a free lunch, you, I start looking for there's got to be some hidden costs. And I think what we've seen with this is this debasement of the currency. But yeah, you can do this, but it, you know, at some point you're eroding the, the value of your currency and it's going to show up in some form of inflation, which we've had a lot of inflation. 
So, I mean, the reason where that, why that money is on the, the Fed's balance sheet is because they did basically MMT. They did QE early on, uh, but then they really wanted to hyperdrive with MMT during COVID. And that, uh, that was very different because it was instead of money that just kind of was in the banking system, excess reserves, it was money that was getting sent to people in the form of the stimulus checks and was getting spent. And it was, you know, my, my view at the time was that was going to be very inflationary. A lot of people argued with me. I had a very big debate about that with some couple of luminaries back in May of 21 at the John Malden Strategic Investment Conference. But it was. It was very inflationary. So I, I think there is going to be a price to pay, but that's what they need. I mean, the, the government really needs to do kind of this stealth debt default. And, and I think a key part of it is to have inflation in reality higher than what it is officially. And that way you can eventually get the debt to GDP down to a more normal number. But the problem is if at some point the bond market wises up and says, look, we're not going to buy these four and a quarter percent U.S. Treasuries 10 year maturities when you're doing this inherently inflationary stuff. We want six or seven. And then all of a sudden the interest rate becomes unaffordable and then you have a true debt crisis. It's going to be interesting in November because you could have if Trump wins and he does enact some of his you know, tax cut and you know, those spending restraint types of policies, you could have a Liz Trust UK kind of thing where the, the US bond market has a riot just like the, the UK bond market had in the fall of 22. So there's lots of stuff that could go wrong with this idea that we can basically just hide our, our debt on the Fed's balance sheet. I find this topic really interesting. I think we could probably discuss this for a while because I keep comparing the US to, to Japan. Um, with the with the aspect that the U.S. is still the world or the U.S. dollar is the world currency, so there's a bit of a different uh, there are different dynamics at play. But I keep looking at Japan and say, is this the blueprint where the U.S. will go? Will we give up the U.S. dollar to to sustain the way of living that we're at right now? Because the Japan is at 260 percent debt to GDP, the U.S. is at 120 percent. Based on what you just said, there's a lot of runway to go towards Japan to Japanese levels. And uh, it would be possible. The Fed just says, oh, we'll just buy it. Don't worry about it. We'll just buy the, you know, the debt issuance. We'll just buy the bonds. Don't worry about it. Um, right. So it's like, um, you know, in, in theory, is that is that a possibility? Because we, we, call, we keep calling, oh, the market is going to crash. The U.S. is insolvent. You know, the debt is going to blow up. But in reality, I think, uh, you, and you to paraphrase something you said, we're just kicking the can down the road or we could just kick the can down the road. Yes, we could. Uh, they're certainly going to try to do that. I think they're going to try to do even stealthier things than, say, restarting the QE, what I call the, the Fed's magical money machine. And, and by that, I, I think they could do things with the bank reserves and or the, uh, the reserve requirements for holding government securities, take those to zero again. So it makes the banks, you know, they can buy treasuries without you know, putting up any reserves. The idea that they're riskless assets, even though they broke those three banks we talked about and they talked about earlier, they didn't go down because of credit problems. They went down because of their U.S. Treasury holdings. So you know, people kind of forget you can lose a lot of money in treasuries, even in uh, nominal terms when interest rates go up a lot. In real terms, of course, the bondholders have been absolutely destroyed over the last three or four years. So it's you know that gets back to how stupid is the bond market? Will the bond market play along with that? And I think they'll they'll try to do things that that prevent the uh, bond market from going into a DEFCON 4 type of mentality, you know, high alert. Uh, so it, I think there's going to be a lot of gamesmanship, including the drawing down that TGA. And uh, they've got a lot of levers they can pull, but I do think they're starting to run out of some of the ones that are more effective. But also with Japan, realize that all that debt that they owe, government debt they owe, they own eternally. Whereas the U.S. has, it's, we're the world's largest debtor country. We used to be the world's largest creditor country. And we run tw twin deficits. Not only do we run a federal deficit, we run a trade deficit, too, that's about a little under a trillion dollars. So between the two, there you're running at almost $3 trillion. And whereas Japan typically is in a surplus situation, they're one of the world's largest creditor countries. So it's very, very different. Uh, and they've also got a fantastically undervalued currency. And I do think at some point you're going to get a repatriation of money back into Japan from overseas. And, and that's going to be interesting when that happens. That, that could have some destabilizing impacts on financial markets. But it's a, it's a crazy world out there, Kai. I mean, I, I'm definitely a believer that we're in the fourth turning. This is the Neil Howe thesis that we're in a mega crisis period. These come along about every 20, 25 years. 
uh, I'm sorry, about every 80 years, uh, they run in about 20, 25 year cycles, but you have you know, the first turning, second turning, third turning, fourth turning is, is the rough one. And that's the one that, that we're in right now. They tend to be inflationary. They tend to be, uh, you know, tend to be kind of war prone. And a lot of people believe we're in a, a form of World War III right now. And I guess I wouldn't disagree with that. But and that's what's so bizarre is you have such frothy financial markets at a time of such tremendous societal strife and geopolitical threats and overall national on the way. It's uh, it's bizarre. You would think the stock market would be actually cheap, not one of its most expensive ever. No, no, I agree. And uh, by the way, like up here somewhere should, uh, is that the left side? No, this side up there over your head, David, I think we'll, we'll put an info card because we've interviewed Neil Howe on this channel as well. And we talked about exactly that. And what, what cycle are we in? And uh, are we in the fourth turning? And what does it look like right now? Right? Um, so on, on that topic, David, let, let's talk about the impact of all that we've just discussed on the precious metals. Uh, gold has moved dramatically from 2000 to about 2400. It's a massive move for for a, a 5000 year old relic. Right. Um, let, let's talk about the implications there. Like, uh, does does gold have more runway, and uh, how happy are you with the current valuation of gold there? Well, I'm, I'm happy that it's gone up because we own a lot of gold related securities. Uh, but as you pointed out earlier, it did pull back a little bit, and it's been a fairly controlled move. But I would, you know, we're big believers when a, uh, an asset class or security makes a multi year new high, in this case, an all time new high. That's a very bullish signal. You typically will keep on going. Now, oftentimes, interestingly, it goes up about 20%, then it kind of consolidates, and that's exactly what we've seen so far. But long term, I do think gold goes a lot higher. Could it be 5,000? Could it be 10,000? I don't know. I know there's a belief that that the U.S. is going to have to try to collateralize, if you will, its treasuries outstanding with gold, and they're going to have to do it at a much, much higher gold price because they don't own that much gold. That could happen. That's certainly one of the upside kickers. But I guess an easier way to play it is to look at the miners where they have lagged so significantly, though some of them have really good moves lately, but there's still some that have, have lagged that are starting to report very positive earnings surprises. We wrote one up uh, actually yesterday in our newsletter for our paying subscribers that it was courtesy of Fred Hickey. Fred, you should have Fred on your show if you haven't. He's terrific in the gold space and he knows the gold miners in and out, inside out. I've, I'm a subscriber to service. I'm also a friend. And I've made a lot of money buying uh, Fred's uh, mining ideas. So I, I think that's a way, uh, particularly on any weakness, to take advantage of this gold bull market, which I do think is uh, still got a lot further to run. But it's going to be wild. And I think when the trouble with commodities, and I see this all the time in energy, is they hear the story and they go, gosh, it sounds like energy's got to go higher. And they buy it, it runs up, they buy more, and then the correction comes. They go, oh, God, that was a bad, I'm now down because of you know, buying at a higher price. And so they give up on it and then they miss you know, the huge move. So you just, you have to, I think part of it is when you do get uh, these strong rallies that happen periodically, take a little bit of money off the table. And we've actually done that with uh, the precious metal related securities. We've taken some money off the table into this rally, but we're prepared to buy back again. And actually, if you wanted to talk about a commodity of metal that I think has got tremendous upside, I'd bring up palladium which is one of the most disliked commodities out there currently, industrial metals, uh, because it's viewed as being a buggy whip, basically, by what's happening with EVs. EVs don't use palladium. But I think what's, what they're missing is where the real rapid growth is for kind of new age autos is with hybrids. And hybrids actually use more palladium than do internal combustion engines. And that very few people are aware of that. So that's, uh, I think that's a very, unfortunately, it's very hard to play with equities with mm -hmm. palladium. There aren't very many that you can buy, but the palladium itself is, is quite easy to buy in the form of an ETF. A lot of it is coming out of Russia as well, I believe, right? Palladium? Yes. And of course, it's, you know, it's, it's compromised. Uh, so that's another, you know, bullish factor. So when Ukraine was invaded, palladium went to 3000 or very close to $3,000 an ounce. Now it's back down to, uh, around 900, you know, something like 950. So it's come down hard. It was even a little weaker here a couple of weeks ago. It's had a bit of a rally, but uh, I just think that the market is really off sides about this, where they're just so concerned that palladium demand is going to fall off the, the table because of EVs when they actually could see a demand acceleration. So that's when you have that kind of a misperception, you've got a pretty good profit making potential.
Well, that that is interesting because uh, admitting that that we're switching more to hybrids than to to proper EVs is probably admitting defeat on the whole energy transition, quite honestly. And uh, you know, well, I, I don't think. I mean, they're pretty good at saying, well, you know, we were sort of right. And you know, when you look at like <laughs> BYD's got a hybrid that's coming out that's got over a thousand mile range per gallon of gas. It's I'm just per tank of gas. It's like, well. What I mean, really, for that incremental difference, is it really worth it? And, you know, you get the range anxiety, you get the charging issues, you've got the tire issues. And a lot of people don't realize these hybrids are very polluting from their tires because they're so heavy. So that's a fascinating topic that's you know worthy of uh, more time than we have. But uh, and of course, they put a lot of pressure on the grid when the grid is already incredibly fragile. It's going to get more fragile because of all the AI electricity uh, demand. That these data centers, so these AI, AI data centers, are absolute energy hogs. Hmm. So it's something that that will help to prevent the grid grid from collapsing. You would think that even the politicians would say, "Hey, that's maybe a better green solution than EVs." I think that day is already happening, and plus the fact consumers are just increasingly not that excited about them. Also, they chew up the road, the EVs. Like that's another thing. They chew up other other parts of the infrastructure as well. Because they are heavy, and that's where a lot of this, this extra tire shredding happens, and these little micro particles, which are very harmful to, you know, like rivers and fish. And so, you know, th there's no form of energy or transportation that's perfect. They, these things all have drawbacks. That's true of, certainly it's true of fossil fuels. It's true of uh, even nuclear. However, nuclear is going through a, a tremendous renaissance. I think that's an area for your people to really be watching. Long term, the uranium, even though it's rallied, it's pulled back here recently. I think uranium's got another upload coming. Uh, the number of reactors that are on the drawing boards are just staggering around the world. And where's all that uranium going to come? They're, they're, you've really got a supply problem there. In that case, it's Kazakhstan, which is having a tremendous production uh, shortfall. And I think that's going to be with us for years to come, frankly. Yeah, we just saw $1.2 billion takeover in the uranium space in Canada as well. Palladium, uh, Paladin Energy bought uh, fission uranium, or is in the process of buying fission uranium for about $1.2 billion. Do either one of them make any money? That's uh, they're both exploration projects, aren't they? It's like no Paladin. I, I'm not an expert on Paladin, but they have an operation. But uh, Fission is an exploration project, development stage project. So that that one it's, is uh, that's that's a challenge with that space because we look all the time. I mean, there's Cameco that makes money. But other than that, you got a lot of development projects that are you know, NXE is pretty intriguing, but it's years away from production. So it's it's tricky whereas when you go into the energy world i mean the traditional energy world oil and gas i mean these companies are generating enormous cash flow and dividends and you know some great value so that's and i think that is kind of a stealth way to play ai is to, to, to the accelerating demand for natural gas because these data centers they can't rely on intermittent renewables they've got to have at, at least a natural gas combined cycle backup yeah, but those stocks have had some decent moves. The natural gas was left for dead a few months ago, and then, of course, it's just rallied ferociously. Uh, so at this point, I think uh, some of the oil names maybe look a little bit more interesting. Now, yeah. um, Dave, I have very, one last very, uh, question for you because your phone is ringing off the hook, so I don't want to keep you much longer there. But uh -huh, um, so like we, we talked about gold and gold miners. Uh, just real quick, Q no Q2 numbers, uh, what are your expectations? Because we haven't really seen a broad-based rally. Uh, could Q2 numbers maybe be a bit of a trigger for a broader rally because free cash flow is potentially increasing? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts and what are your expectations there? Sorry, you're talking about the gold miners specifically? Yeah, the gold miners. Yeah, just going back yeah, to absolutely. the gold miners real absolutely. quick. Absolutely. It's just like... The analysts have not raised their numbers for this higher price. And margins, according to Fred Hickey, and I think he's right, the margins are going to be up like 40%. And yet the estimates are basically what they were when gold was still 1900 2000 So I do think there's a definite potential for some very positive earnings reports that finally get the attention of uh, the analyst community. Uh, because gold, I mean, you just you, we're getting even the miners, look at gold ETFs. I mean, they're, they're still getting out outflows from gold ETFs, not inflows. So there's a tremendous apathy towards this area. But the miners, if, if gold is, is neglected, miners are detested. <laughs> that it still, still, still seems to be the case for some reason. I don't know, it's like GDX, GDXJ, they still haven't really broken out. Yes, we've, we've seen an uptick, don't get me wrong, and uh, maybe I'm a bit too greedy here, but uh, I don't think they are where they should be trading, in my opinion. Uh, still too, the, neg the sentiment is still too negative. 
So, um, David, I'm highly appreciative of your time. Uh, really appreciate we've chatting now for almost 55 minutes here. Um, where, where can we follow your work and uh, where can we find your Substack? Well, you can definitely track me easily at the uh, Evergreen GovCal website. So, and uh, you probably put a, a marker to that, but uh, or a link to that. And also, you can go haymaker.substack. So, we're all over Substack with the Haymaker. There's a decent amount of free content there, but we love our paid subscribers and it's a bargain. <laughs> no, fantastic. Awesome. Dave, really appreciate your time. It was tremendously appreciated chatting with you. I had a great time. I thought it was a really fruitful and interesting discussion. We'll definitely have to have you back and uh, maybe, uh, I'm looking September, maybe, right around the time of the first rate cut. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fantastic. So you're, no, you're, you're a better forecaster than I am. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to read the tea leaves. I'm not sure what's going to happen, to be quite honest. I almost thought for a while that we're going to see another rate hike, to be honest, instead of a rate cut. But uh, your guess is good, as good as mine. You know, it's like, I don't have a crystal ball here. Uh, I need to get one. Or well, one of those eight balls. Does it. Uh, I interviewed Lynette Zhang, and I think she has an eight ball sitting around here somewhere. And then uh, she just, just like, ah, let's go with that. <laughs> um, fantastic. David, thank you so much for your time. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I really enjoyed chatting here with David Hay. And uh, if you if you like the discussion that we had, make sure to follow him on his Substack, haymaker.substack.com. Follow him at uh, Evergreen uh, Gavacal as well. and Or Evergreen Gavacal, apologies. And... Uh, Make sure to follow us. Hit that like and subscribe button. Did we ask the right questions? What do you think is going to happen? Are we going to see a rate cut in September? How are the miners going to behave after Q2? Lots to discuss and uh, lots to put in the comments below. We do want to hear from you. Did we ask the right questions? What questions should we ask our guests next? Do we Are we emphasizing the right things? Really curious to hear from you. Let us know. Be constructive. It helps us become a better YouTube channel. We do want to educate. We're discussing the macro so you can understand the micro better. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financially. <laughs>